Gad Saad teaches at the John Molson School of Business at Concordia. He studied at McGill and Cornell. He has degrees in psychology and business and, he, uh, and in math and computer science. He does research on hormones and uh, consumer behavior and of course is the host of The Sad Truth, his uh, video <laughs> show. So uh, uh, join me in welcoming Gad Saad. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I don't know if any of you have seen the classic movie All About Eve, 1950, with uh, Betty Davis. There is a scene, a, a classic scene, where she says, I can't remember the exact words, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> so fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. So what I'm planning on doing is actually uh, offering you some testimony of many of the maladies that are affecting or afflicting our universities. And then I'll offer one or two uh, prescriptive solutions. One of the things that my book agent told me as I'm working on my next book is he said, you can't just be the guy to identify the diseases. You've got to give us the cures. You've got to give people hope. And so in that spirit, at the end, I'll add a few prescriptive comments. Uh, apologies to a few people who were at the Civitas conference last week where I also spoke. A, a few of the slides uh, overlap, so forgive the repetitiveness, but for most of you, uh, the repetition, but for most of you, this hopefully will be new stuff. So I argue that there are two great threats to humanity. Well, not I argue, that's reality. Uh, there are, of course, biological pathogens that come in all sorts of manners. Sometimes they're bacterium, sometimes they're viruses, sometimes they're parasites, and they cause more death throughout human history than your fear of bears and sharks and so on, right? Uh, but I argue that there's another set, another class of viruses. These are idea pathogens. These are pathogens of the human mind, pathogens of the human spirit that regrettably could potentially be as dangerous as biological pathogens. And to kind of further push this notion, there are many cases in nature where you, so as an evolutionary psychologist, of course, I often look at analogies and homologies in the animal kingdom. And so here are some uh, parasitic realities uh, in nature, and then I'll link it to some of the things that interest the group here. So the spider wasp is a much smaller organism than the uh, spider on which it eventually, it eventually stings it, render, rendering it hapless, dragging it to the burrow where it then lays its eggs and then its offsprings eat it in vivo. Now, how is that related to anything that we're interested in here? Well, political, political correctness is the spider wasp. It, it stings us and then haplessly leads us toward the abyss of infinite darkness. Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite that afflicts mice. And when they're afflicted with that parasite, they lose their innate fear of cats. <laughs> Not a good, it's a maladaptive reality. <laughs> P. tenuis is a brainworm that afflicts ungulates, so for example, the moose, and when that moose is inflicted or afflicted with that uh, parasite, it can do what's called circling behavior. So it just literally goes around in a circle, unable to extricate itself from this behavior. So even as the looming predators are approaching, it can't extricate itself. So now, how do we take some of these uh, notions and apply them to the realities we're facing? So they are idea pathogens. Radical feminism, postmodernism, social constructivism, cultural and moral relativism, political correctness, echo chambers void of intellectual diversity, the culture of perpetual offense and victimhood, identity politics coupled with, with uh, progressive self-flagellation, each of these are really, really dangerous idea pathogens. And uh, my next book, tentatively right now, the title is The Parasitic Mind, where I actually sort of lay out where, which ecosystem do these pathogens arise from, universities, uh, and then how do we try to inoculate ourselves or free ourselves from some of these idea pathogens. And so I, I can break up a lot of these 
idea pathogens into three categories. In some cases, we have idea pathogens that attack basic scientific truths. There is no such thing as two phenotypes and homo sapiens. There is no such thing as biological sex. That's a fundamental attack on a reality that is obvious to the average dull two-year-old. But apparently, you're a Nazi bigot if you think that biology matters. Then there are attacks on the epistemology for seeking truth, right? So uh, there, there are endless ways of knowing, and your way of knowing called the scientific method should not be a privileged way. Postmodernism says you know, no objective truths. So in this case, it's not a specific truth that you're attacking, but you're attacking the epistemology of how to go about approaching getting to truth. And then thirdly, there's a class of pathogens that attacks the idea of what it is to navigate through a meritocracy. And, and I'll give examples of each of these for today's talk. I'll begin with all the sort of the feeling stuff that you all know about. We condemn freedom of speech that hurts other people's feelings. Okay. Here is the, for those of you who don't know their work, but I suspect in this room probably most of you do, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms comes out with a yearly index where they uh, rate all Canadian universities on four metrics, university policies, university practices, student union policies, and student union practices. So in this case, they rated 60 universities on these four metrics, so there are 240 possible grades. In a perfect world, you'd have 240 A's. There were six A's out of 240. Six A's, digest that, and 38 F's. Since we're at Western, I'm granting you the courtesy of showing you how much you suck. Western, <laughs> you score a C, D, D, C, but just so that you don't think that I'm not going to show how, bad, how poorly my university does, we're a bit better than you, actually. We're B, C, F, C, but again, neither scores is anything to write home to your parents about. Some of you may have heard of this incident that happened last summer. Uh, Jordan Peterson, myself, Oren Amate, and Faith Goldie were supposed to speak at a conference titled The Stifling of Free Speech on University Campus. It was being held at Ryerson University. That speech was stifled. Uh, and the, the, the incredible thing is that I was accused, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Lebanon, and we're Jewish. I was accused of being a white supremacist, anti-Semitic Nazi. <laughs> so when your moral compass has become so broken that you actually feel emboldened in making that accusation, you suffer from an idea pathogen. Let me just read you this because it's very powerful. This is Edward Schlosser, a professor at a liberal, uh, some, some liberal arts college, I can't remember which one. If you want to follow the sources at the bottom, I have intentionally adjusted my teaching materials as the political winds have shifted. I also make sure all my remotely offensive or challenging opinions, such as this article, are expressed either anonymously or pseudo uh, anonymously. Most of my colleagues who still have jobs have done the same. Hurting a student's feelings, even in the course of instruction that is absolutely appropriate and respectful, can now get a teacher into serious trouble. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the rest, but he's basically saying the way he organizes his pedagogic material is to, is he, by putting it through the sieve of, can I be sure that not a single syllable that I say will offend a single person? And that's astonishing. But that's not North Korea. That's not Cuba. That's here. Now, for those of you who think that you only have to worry about Big Brother University monitoring your speech on campus, no. University of New Hampshire has come up with the wonderful, liberating idea of monitoring students' speech, not while they are under the purview of some university function. function. As private citizens, if they say something that might create an environment that is hostile, uh, then they could be sanctioned. Again, not under the guise of there being you know, students at a university. I mean, that's astonishing. You just have to read the start of this article. Right? So Big Brother is watching you even when you're not on campus. That's happened to me. Let me tell you a story. 
Now this will go into whether it is, what was it, honest civility? What was the term? What was the dichotomy? Hon <laughs> yeah, let's see if it's honest incivility or, or wit. So this uh, degenerate at cell bio Josh, who's an incredibly obnoxious, haughty guy. Never, I didn't know who he was. He started sort of trolling me. 99% of the time, I ignore this stuff. I'm cool. Once in a while, I'm bored, and I feel like taking some guy on. <laughs> and I do it with complete wit and with a smile on my face. I decided to take this idiot on. And at one point, because he was being so haughty, I said, no, 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 the retarded schmuck recently learned how to pronounce vowels, respect him. Okay? I had no idea who this guy was. I mean, literally no idea. He's an anonymous guy on Twitter. He could be a guy, a, a woman, I don't know. He starts by tweeting to my university, he's hurt, he's been attacked. It's homophobia. So then other people respond, say, well, what are you talking about? Why is it homophobia? What are you talking about? I don't know what his sexual orientation is. I don't know if he's a man or a woman. He says, well, the use of the word degenerate, which is not here, not in this tweet, has homophobic connotations. So then he tries to rile up my university that way. It doesn't work. Then he tries to rile up the social justice warriors. It doesn't work. He contacts my university. Okay, this is happening in the 21st century in Canada. He contacts my university to complain about this tweet. By the way, Twitter take, kicks me off uh, the platform for 12 hours, right? Because his feelings are so precious that me calling him retarded schmuck after he was attacking me was something that he simply could not handle. Is this someone as an adult who could function healthily in society? Anyways, the university contacts me after hours, politely, to question me about this. Can you guess how that conversation went? I said, so you're, contacted me, you're contacting me uh, after hours because you think that it is within your purview to question what I say to whom when I'm not operating as a professor. For, oh, but Professor Saad, he's a student. I said, he's a student somewhere. He's not my student. It's not, it wasn't under my guise as his professor. It turns out that he's a graduate student in Australia. So <laughs> retarded schmuck was so hostile to him that the 10,000 miles separating us was not enough for him to feel protected. <laughs> but the fact that the university felt sufficiently emboldened to not laugh him out, but to follow up, tells you the state that we're in. Continuing with sort of the coddling, and we're all special, here's a fantastic source. This is the gentleman, the source that I'm showing you. He's a, he used to be a professor at uh, Duke University showing you the great inflation uh, from 1983 uh, all the way to 2013. It's astonishing. The average grades used to be C's. The average grades now are hovering towards A's. Look at the next slide. The professors are better now. The professor, <laughs> that, that's exactly right. As somebody who studies consumer psychology, I detest the metaphor of students as consumers and so on, and we are service providers. We're not professors. We're, we're providing a service. Well, here you see that the most common grade that is now received is an A. 45% of grades, of all grades assigned, are A's. It used to be C's. So if any of you graduated you know, with honors or cum laude, Today, that grade would not pass. <laughs> this is an article that I wrote a while ago, and it's only gotten worse. Uh, the article was titled, I'll have large fries, <laughs> a hamburger, a Diet Coke, and an MBA. Hold the pickles. Okay? And this is, a, so I've, 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 I've obtained an MBA. But when I obtained the MBA, I think the, it was 67 credits. It was two full years, four semesters of five to six courses, graduate courses, a semester for you to finish. 25 years later, it's roughly half that. I think now it's about 40 something. Well, what happened? What, I mean, why is it that 20 years ago, you'd have to pass through a much, much larger hoop to get the MBA? Well, because you know, market conditions, people are busy, we have to water it down, you could do it on the weekend, you could, that's attacking the integrity 
of the academic process. I won't read this whole thing, but just to kind of give you some good news, here's the archetype of what I would consider the ideal student. This is an email that I received just a few days ago from a student who had done very poorly in my course, yet wrote to me to simply say, I I'm sorry that I did poorly. I think your, great, your course was fantastic. I take responsibility, what, <laughs> uh, for having done poorly. And this is the first time that someone writes this, I appreciate this spiritual experience. <laughs> Now that's some good feedback. When, when a student is able to uh, characterize your course as a spiritual experience, that's a good thing. So in this case, the student is taking personal responsibility. They're being intrinsically motivated. That's certainly the type of traits that we need to be uh, fostering in our students. I always tell my students when they are thinking about, you know, whining about their grades, I give them the following analogy. When I go see my physician and he gives me my cholesterol scores, I don't negotiate for a better cholesterol score. <laughs> My cholesterol score is it. And so your grade is it down to the last two decimals. And usually I don't end up having any problems with them. Not only is grading racist, peer review, reviewed research is research. So the process by which we adjudicate good ideas from bad ones using the peer review process, that inherently itself is a form of white supremacy. So this is, some of you would of course know this case, UBC law professor Lorna June McHugh argued that the peer review process is antithetical to her oral traditions and the human rights tribunal said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, let's, let's talk about it. Uh, and then of course I added here, and this is because it's, it's, as someone who's now been a professor for almost 25 years, I see it. If you go through the tenure process, rest assured you're going to get tenure as long as you're not a white male. And I know this from personal experience. I mean, not, not me, but at, as having sat on tenure committees, every single case is overturned. So I could, we could sit there, we could waste tons of time. It goes through the different layers. A person has not been in the least bit productive and then they refuse tenure and then you, you show up the next year. Oh, look, they're here. And you never find out what happened, but you know that they simply filed some grievance you know that they weren't a white male and somehow the denial of their tenure was overturned. So as I wrote here, productivity is for suckers, your identity is your CV. Uh, since of course the whole peer review process and tenure is all part of white supremacy, I decided to uh, give you a list of things that have now been defined as being white supremacy. I won't go through all of these. Pumpkin. Sorry, what is it? Pumpkin. But yeah, pump, pumpkin's latte, actually. It's, it's pumpkin's latte. Uh, <laughs> Disney, taking exam, meritocracy, voting for Trump, having white children is white supremacy. Uh, Thomas Jefferson statue, white marble and artwork, science is white supremacy, capitalism, mathematics, free speech, medieval studies, university mascots, Halloween costumes, milk is a form of white nationalism, saying all lives matter is white supremacy, promoting diversity of thought, the US Constitution, and I don't know what that means, but the invention of the white race is a form of white supremacy. This is not, this is not satire. For those of you who watch my stuff, you know that I'm pretty big on satire and sarcasm but they're always beating me. Reality is always ahead of my satire. <laughs> this is at Trent University in Canada. It's okay to be against whiteness. And look at the quote, not, not by Lindsay Shepard, but by Lindsay Yates, the Trent Central Student Association Ethical Standards Commissioner. It sounds very ominous. Uh, whiteness upholds systems of power like capitalism and patriarchy and as we continue accessing and not acknowledging the privilege of being white, we help to uphold these oppressive systems. So capitalism is an instantiation of white supremacy. Uh, the CBC, surprise, contacted me to comment on this and of course they took the following quote, they were, they were accurate, judge people on their individual merits and faults and let's stop with this identity politics nonsense. This is at my city, one of my alma maters, McGill campus. If any of you have not watched this clip, you should. It's a clip of a gathering of a Me Too, you know, at McGill. It's, it's, it really is astonishing. It's difficult to watch it and believe that this is truly happening at a leading world institution. They start off by, so this is a Me Too, you know, the, the whole uh, sexual assault and so on. They start off by 
sort of pointing to white men as being the problem. Because, of course, there is no recorded evidence whatsoever that any other men engage in sexual violence other than white men. And then they apologize for standing on stolen land. And then they engage in what's called a progressive stack. If those of you who don't know what that is, this is where if you're given you know, the, the platform to speak, uh, you speak or not as a function of where you rank in the progressive stack. So a white woman gets up and says, well, you know, I'm just a white woman, so I don't, I don't think I should be speaking, so I'm willing to cede my space if there are any transgendered indigenous or people of color and so on and so forth. And, but this is not satire. This is, this, and, and the people are, are applauding her. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So whether you have a right to speak or not is a function of where you rank in victimology poker. There is an ideology and a legal system that treats people this way. Does anybody know what that system is called? Sorry? It's called Sharia law. Okay? It's where I come from in the Middle East. Sharia law is contrary to our systems of law where we're, it's supposed to be blind justice. It recognizes that a crime is more or less severe as a function of the identity of the two participants. The victim and the perpetrator uh, will determine, their identity will determine whether I should punish you X or Y. Identity politics is just a new instantiation of that grotesque system. Here's identity politics now shaping the highest level of chaired professorships that the Canadian government gives. So for those of you who are academics, there is the Canada Research Chairs. Now the Canadian government has put, with, as, as, the, as part of the metrics that they look at when they're deciding whether who should get the Canada Research Chair, one of the things is, you know, are you from an indigenous background or a woman and so on. That, of course, has come to Concordia, where at my university, where we have what's called the Concordia University Research Chairs, which is a, a chaired professorship that I've held for 10 years. And my chaired professorship ends this May. And so I was applying for my next chair. Now here, look what they wrote. The proportion of appointments by level faculty and principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And also they talk about gender equity. They put the following figure. So I was applying for what's called a tier one uh, chaired professorship. At the John Molson School of Business, zero women have it. Three men have it. Uh-oh. Uh, I went up against a departmental colleague. She ovulates. I don't. Uh, our dossiers, I'll leave it to you to decide. Uh, but I'm willing to put them both up publicly, and then you can decide uh, who should have gotten it. And it's not just a title. It comes with huge amounts of income stipend research stipends, course remissions. So it's not just, oh, gee, I didn't get a nice title. There are real repercussions uh, that affect real people. The good news for me, though, is that the Canadian Senate taught me that my gender can change on any given day. <laughs> and so therefore, next year, I plan to apply with a much stronger dossier when I'll be self-identifying as a woman. By the way, uh, the gentleman in question here, you see, this is me uh, speaking in front of the Canadian Senate regarding Bill C-16. It was briefly mentioned, I think, earlier today. Bill C-16, nobody questions the fact, or at least uh, if you truly are a classically liberal person, uh, of course I support the right of everybody to live free of hate and bigotry and to have all of the rights that are afforded to all of us. But I was, in my case, speaking as an evolutionary psychologist in terms of whether when is it going to be the case that someone could say, hey, you're talking about evolved sex differences in your course, which is sort of the foundational mechanism. Natural and sexual selection are the two mechanisms, the evolutionary mechanisms that explain much of who we are. Well, wouldn't that be transphobic systemic violence in quotes, as Harvard said? Aren't I perpetuating, quote, fixed binaries and biological essentialism. So I was making a very sober scientific argument as to the potential dangers of Bill C-16, not questioning the fact that all people should live with full dignity and have all the rights that are afforded to all of us. 
right? Well, whatever, what happened to Lindsay Shepard is exactly what I was warning against. I mean, not in those exact ways that it happened to her. Well, this senator accused me of promulgating pro-genocide message. You can go and watch it. So the Lebanese Jew who escaped execution in Lebanon and came to Canada to live freely here and is now trying to protect people from all this nonsense was a pro-genocide supporter. This is the discourse in the Canadian Senate. You can go all watch it. Now let's see if, if, if it is the case that the Canada Research Chairs and the Concordia University Research Chairs really need to ramp up the help for women because they're so marginalized in universities, we could use this thing called data to try to decide whether uh, that's true. Well, it turns out that the US government has that data for us. So they looked at five races, all the five racial breakdowns, across four educational attainment, associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctorate. So there are 20 cells, five races, by four educational attainment. And in each of the cells, you could look at what's the ratio of male to females who obtained that degree. So if the, if the victimology narrative is true, 20 out of 20 cells would have men outnumbering women in those cells. What's the actual number? 20 out of 20 cells, women outnumber men. So, so, so take a moment and, and process that. Every single cell, every race, and every degree, women get more degrees than men across the whole possible landscape of data. That doesn't get you to question whether we should be having a gender equity program. Well, if we, if we have to have gender equity at this point, it should be the reverse one. Here's, what, here's the rampant sexism at Canadian medical schools women outnumber men now at almost all the schools. So that's why you know, we need to give them more perks. Now again, this is not questioning the fact that for many, many years, there was institutionalized sexism against women. No one's questioning that and no, but no one needs to lecture me about that since I come from the Middle East where there continues to be massive endemic institutionalized sexism against women and I speak out against it. But we need to be able to change the narrative when the data no longer supports the victimology narrative. But apparently, you're a Nazi bigot if you do that. Let me now give you some examples of attacks on scientific truths and attacks on the epistemology for generating truths. Some of you may have seen the story if you follow my work. This is a story that happened to me. This is in 2002, and in a second you'll understand what these two images mean. Uh, in 2002, one of my doctoral students had just uh, finished his PhD. He's actually now a Canada Research Chair Professor at Laurier. His name is Tripat Gill. And we were going out to celebrate his finishing his PhD. And he told me, oh, I'm bringing a, a, uh, a date with me. And it was myself and my wife. And so we were going out to the, he said, but I just want to give you a heads up, uh, Professor. She's a you know, she's a radical feminist and a postmodernist and a cultural anthropologist, so can we tone it down? <laughs> <laughs> to which I said, oh, mom's the word. <laughs> of course I wasn't going to keep quiet. We knew that that promise was going to be violated at some point. So during the evening, at one point, I said to the lady, so I hear you're a postmodernist. Yes. I said, well, do you mind if I offer you, so postmodern, uh, there are no objective truths. Uh, do you mind if I offer you, because as an evolutionary psychologist, I do work under the assumption that there are universal truths. Uh, there are things called human universals. Uh, so can I pitch some, what I consider to be universals, and then you could tell me how I'm wrong? Yeah, go ahead. I said, okay, well, within Homo sapiens, only women bear children. So I, 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 Prophesy, uh, I was being prophetic about the whole Bill C-16 way before it happened. I said, only women can bear children. Is that, is that a universal? She looked at me with utter disgust, with contempt. She huffed and puffed. She rolled her eyes. I said, absolutely not. I said, no, it's not only women that bear children. She goes, no, there is a, tri a Japanese tribe off some island 
where within the spiritual realm, within their spiritual doctrines, it is men who bear children. By you restricting the conversation to the biological materialist realm, that's how you keep us barefoot and pregnant. After I recovered from my mini stroke, <laughs> I then asked, OK, well, maybe it's too controversial for me to argue that women bear children. That's, that seems to be too taboo. Let's take a, a slightly more innocuous example. Is it true since time immemorial that sailors have presumed that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? Is that, is that true? Here she used something called deconstructionism. She said, what do you mean? I don't play labels. What do you mean by east and west? What do you mean by sun? That which you call sun, I call, and now you'll understand, I call dancing hyena. And there, I said, but fine. So the dancing hyena rises in the east and sets in the west. <laughs> if I don't put dancing hyena lotion on my skin, I might get a dancing hyena burn. <laughs> she said, no, 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 I don't play those games. Now that's not, she wasn't an anomaly. She wasn't an outlier. She is what is being taught to all your kids with your hard earned money. Not only are you losing all the money, you are infecting those children or young adults uh, with idiotic, anti-science, anti-reason, anti-logic nonsense. So there's a real cost to allowing these viruses to proliferate. Let me just mention a few uh, other examples. So this is the liberating lens of academic feminism. The, the list is actually much longer, but there are fields, feminist science, feminist mathematics, Mathematics, we have a mathematician here. I mean, I thought that mathematics would be the one area where we can absolutely be free of identity politics. No, and I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, let's go down, well, feminist business school is the idea that the term profit, to, to profit, capitalism, these are inherently uh, patriarchal ways of viewing the economy. And therefore, we need to build uh, business schools that are based on a more sort of inclusive feminist ethos. And then feminist biology, this is not satire, this is true. This paper has been cited over 1,200 times, published in the University of Chicago Press Journals. So this is not some sort of quack paper, paper published or whatever, you know, nonsense journal. She argues that the whole manner by which we describe conception there is an egg, and she's passive, so she's Victorian. And then there are these spermatozoa that are active and adventuresome, and so on. That whole thing, that language, to describe conception in that way is already starting this you know, sexist gender roles. She's not joking. She's not being satirical. She's a very serious, quote, scholar who's been cited 1,200 times. Prophetic satire, and actually the, there's a mathematician in this room who, who at lunch told me, oh, I, I watched this clip of yours. Uh, here, by the way, this is when I'm, do, when I'm satirizing the social justice warriors, I bring out this, uh, uh, well, what, what do you call it? Uh, wig, thank you. I was thinking of the term in French. Uh, I, the first time that I brought out that wig, I called my wife. I said, hey, do you know where that red wig is? And she's like, why are you asking this? So don't worry about it. And eventually, that wig has become part of the, uh, the sad truth classics. So here, what I did is I, I had said, this was completely satirical. This is kind of a SoCal hoax type of uh, clip. I said that I had founded a new field as someone who had studied mathematics and someone who's very pro you know, progressive and you know, to social justice. I had founded a new field called social justice mathematics. And so in doing so, you should really watch the clip. And by the way, that prophetic satire is now reality. For example, I argue that irrational numbers is absolutely a bad thing because it marginalizes mental illness. Uh, the inequality operator creates an ableist mentality. Prime, real, and perfect numbers, it's all divisive language. Binary numbers, they perpetuate fixed binaries. Laplace transform uses the trans prefix, so it is transphobic. 
and equilateral triangles are inclusive, isosceles and scaling triangles are bigoted. <laughs> and actually, some people wrote to me, and they actually didn't think that I was being satirical. And it was like, good, good stuff. Well, a year later, I start getting calls from the media asking me to comment about exactly what my prophecy was, which is now there was a book that was written saying that we need to have more social justice in mathematics, the mathematics as currently taught is white supremacy, and so on and so forth. So that which I had thought no one could ever come up with such stupidity, it only took 10 months, and it caught up to my satire. Decolonized science. So this is really basically saying out with the epistemology of science, right? Now, here is a Quebec deputy minister who got pushback recently because he questioned the place of indigenous traditional knowledge. Now, let me, let me be clear. As an evolutionary psychologist, I understand that people have ecological knowledge that's specific to an ecosystem. So nobody is questioning that, right? So you could have been in a particular region where you've been there for many, many generations, and you could have knowledge about the fauna and flora. This is content knowledge. This is ecological knowledge that you absolutely have greater knowledge than the rest of us. That doesn't mean that at the epistemological level, you have different way of knowing. You don't solve cancer either through sexist Western medicine or you dance to the rain man doing booga booga, right? That's not how it works. So yes, we should be respectful of local knowledge that people may have, but there is only one epistemology. There's only one game in town, and it's called the scientific method. And so other ways of knowing are not equal. If they're going to be equal, then they have to be put through this exact same scrutiny of the scientific method. And so University of Cape Town, a rather prestigious university in the African continent, held a sit-in where they said science must fall. And the people who were promulgating that idea are now known as fallists. The idea that science itself, all of science, Darwin, Newton, it's all built on one way of knowing. And there are other ways of knowing. And if you attack those ways of knowing, then you are engaging in epistemological colonialism. Okay? And here's an example of a paper published in a real journal where they exactly argue that. So these are real cancers of the human mind. They're, they're, they really are intellectual terrorism, right? Now, now I'm going to get, I'm, I'm almost done. Now I'm going to get to, I guess, some prescriptive stuff. Before I do that, let me talk about two uh, nonsensical ideas. Social constructivism is really the idea that we're born tabula rasa with empty minds. And it is only the processes of socialization that make us who we are. Now, as an evolutionist, I don't question the fact that socialization is important. Of course we're socialized. We're socialized by our parents and our rabbis and, and television. That's all true. But by the way, socialization happens in its form because of biology. So it's not antithetical. It's not biology or the environment. Nurture happens because of nature. Okay? But in any case, we are born with biological imperatives. It's trivially obvious to show this. You show that, for example, by taking children who are too young to have been socialized and show that they have certain preferences that they could not have learned. I'll talk about that in a second. So the idea of hard, radical social constructivism is complete nonsense. But it is something that's been promulgated in the social sciences and the humanities for 30, 40 years. Biophobia is kind of a, a, a consequence of that. Biophobia is fear of biology. So biology is OK in describing the behavior of the mosquito and the rabbit and the zebra. But don't you dare apply biology to explain human affairs. Somehow humans transcend biology. right? That's what makes us human, according to these folks. What makes us human is that we are not under the purview of the same biological imperatives as the zebra. We're cultural animals. And of course, we're not. We're both cultural animals and biological animals. So how would you dismantle something like this? So next, what I'm going to talk about is a epistemological tool that you could all use when you're having these trench ideological warfares with people. So take, for example, well, why do you think I put these two toy things? So toy preferences is sort of one of the classic examples of so-called social constructivism. 
the idea is that little boys are taught to play aggressively with blue trucks. Little girls are taught to play in a nurturing manner with pink dolls. And that starts a cascade of gender-specific socialization, right? And a truly progressive person would have their son play with dolls and would have uh, their daughter play with guns, right? But if you're a toy company, you don't care about ideological dogma. You care about selling things. And so that's why practitioners typically never give me grief for my theories because they don't care about ideological dogma. They care about how do you describe reality as it really exists, right? So let's see if I could construct for you. This is called, bear with me, this is a bit technical. Excuse me. This is called a nomological network of cumulative evidence. What does that mean? If I want to make an argument that something is an adaptation, something is due to a biological cause, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try. So for example, here, uh, are toy preferences biological based or are they completely social constructions? Okay. So then I would think, what would be the data that I would have to show you to prove to you in an unassailable manner that there is a biological basis to toy preferences. And that epistemological process is what I call nomological networks of cumulative evidence. And I'll go through a few, I won't go through the, all of them, but I'll give you a bit of an example. Charles Darwin himself had used nomological networks, although he didn't call it that in his days, when he was uh, you know, collecting all of the data for origin of species over a 20 plus year period, what was he effectively doing? He was methodically, judiciously collecting data from endless different sources, which when you put it all together, it became impossible to dispute his theory. And if 150 years later, a lot of very motivated people have tried to dispute it, and it still stands. And so let me show you how we could apply it in the current context. Well, I could take children, look at this one. This comes from developmental psychology. I could take children who are in the pre-socialization stage, meaning that they don't yet have the cognitive development to be socialized. So by definition, I'm ruling out that possibility. And I could show that they exhibit sex-specific toy preferences, that bo boys will reach out to, to, to the truck or stare at the truck more and vice versa for girls. So already, that first box is casting doubt on the idea that it's all due to social construction. But let's see if I can give you a few more that really build sort of the tsunami of evidence against that position. You could take, this is called comparative psychology, this one here. I could look to other animals. So I could take rhesus monkeys. I could take vervet monkeys. I could take chimpanzees. And I could show that the infants within those species exhibit the same sex-specific toy preferences. Now, are they also being under the influence of patriarchal sexism? Or might there be some homology across the behaviors? Now, if that's not enough, let me do one more. But if, if we did all of them, believe me, even the one who is least convinced would be convinced by the end of this lecture. You could take kids who suffer from something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endocrinological disorder, if little girls suffer from it, they become masculinized. They become masculinized in their morphology and in their behavior. Well, you take little girls who suffer from this endocrinological disorder and you study their toy preferences, what do you think happens to their toy preferences? They become masculinized. So if I stop the conversation right there, I, I'm not going to do all of them, Already, that is casting huge doubt on your idea that it's all due to the vagaries of the evil patriarchy. I didn't have to get into histrionics. I had to just simply be very judicious and think about what are the wide variety of data that I could offer you to convince you that you're peddling bullshit, right? And someone earlier, I won't point to them, said to me, you know, how is it that you carry yourself in such public forums with such confidence? Well, part of it is the luckiness of the random combination of genes that led to who I am. Uh, I happen to just be confident. But part of it comes from not speaking about something unless I'm fully confident that the data fully supports me. 
And the way that I do that is by building these nomological networks. And so all of us in this room should certainly benefit from understanding that epistemology. If you want to know if a particular religion is peaceful or not, build a nomological network. There is a wide range of data that you could collect, that's already been collected for you, that will unequivocally answer the question of whether Islam is peaceful or not, whether Jainism is peaceful or not. You don't have to guess, you don't have to listen to your friend, you could, you could build that data. Bear with me a bit, I think we're still okay, bear with me. Has, does anybody know what the hygiene hypothesis is? You, you do? Okay, that's good. Uh, in evolutionary medicine, evolutionary medicine is basically applying evolutionary principles, uh, well, in medicine. Understanding the adaptive processes that led to our bodies to be able to better cure diseases. The hygiene hypothesis is a beautiful idea that basically said, well, it's not an idea, it's, it's been confirmed empirically. So if you take children who suffer from respiratory ailments or those who don't, it turns out that whether they've been exposed from a young age to respiratory pathogens determines whether they're going to suffer from ailments. And it's, it might not be what you think intuitively. If they've grown up in very sterile environments, that's when they develop respiratory ailments. Why? Because their immune system has not received the inputs to kick in their immunological defenses. So if I grow up in an OCD sterile home, I'm more likely to, to develop asthma. If I grow up in an environment where there are pets and a bit of dander here and there, I'm less likely to develop uh, asthma. So this brilliant neuropsychiatrist, Steve, I wish I had come up with the idea, but he beat me to it. Steve Stankovicius analogized this to ideas. He said that what we're doing in universities is creating sterile environments, sterile echo chambers, akin to the, the, the allergens, right? You need allergens to develop your protection for, against respiratory ailments. You need contrary ideas to develop your capacity to think. To, to develop your capacity for critical thinking. It's a, it's a truly beautiful analogy. So let's see how, whether we have political echo chambers at universities or not. This study just came out. The, the author, uh, Langbert, had actually emailed me to, to tell me about his paper. So this is a study that was done 51 of the top ranked liberal arts colleges. 8,688, so this is a very big, very representative uh, sample size. More than 5,000 of which registered as either Democrats or Republicans. And all I'm going to show you here, I won't go through all of them, it's the ratio of Democrats to Republicans across disciplines. The least lopsided, the least lopsided is 1.6. Now, now, for example, in medicine, if you had a 1.6 odds ratio, that would be a huge effect, right? Here, that's the least one is at 1.6. Now, let's keep going. I won't do all of them. Very quickly, you get to 8.2 to 1 ratio, and let's keep going. Oh, yes, sociology, 43.8. Anthropology, you can't calculate the Democrat to, to, to Republican ratio because it's a unicorn. He doesn't exist, the Republican. It's 56 to zero. And in communications, it's 108 to zero. Now, you might say, and I, I receive, as you might imagine, endless emails from people. Sometimes they write to me and say, well, so what's the big deal with that? Professors are smart, so of course they're going to be Democrats. Boy, you must be part of the problem, right? <laughs> On many issues like fiscal policy, uh, foreign policy, uh, is the death penalty a good idea for serial pedophiles or not? There is no absolute scientific truth. There are compelling arguments to be made both pro and con any of these issues. Now, I might fit on this side, you might fit, but, but there really is value in hearing your side of why you think the death penalty is good or bad. But imagine if you've grown up or you've been inculcated in an ideological uh, sterile environment. You don't build your defenses. And just to show you the next slide, it turns out that the more prestigious the university is, so in this case, you break it up into tiers, tier one meaning most prestigious and so on. The more prestigious the university is, the more lopsided. 
So the most prestigious universities, the ratio of Democrats to Republicans is 21.5 to 1. That's just breathtaking. So heterodox academy, which some of you know, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to fight that incredibly politically sterile environment that we see in universities. Canadian universities, I won't go through the whole thing, but it's roughly the same. It's, it's the same sort of bias. So last slide, how do we save our universities? So let me just read it for you. Number one, Pursue knowledge unencumbered by ideological activism. No knowledge is forbidden if gathered objectively using the scientific method. I, I had a chat uh, last year with, some of you may know him, Sam Harris, uh, on his show, and he asked me, in your research, is there anything that you would consider forbidden to study? And my answer was a very quick, absolutely not. If you study it with complete objectivity, and adhering as best as you can to the scientific method, then you could never have the calculus of, oh, but what if someone eventually misuses that? Then physics should never have been studied because it led to the atomic bomb, right? I mean, it's, it's an endless slippery slope. Okay? No more identity politics. Instead, promote the dignity of the individual rather than supporting oppression Olympics and victimology poker. No more coddling of the culture of offense and the ethos of perpetual victimhood. No microaggressions, no trigger warnings, no safe spaces, and no cultural appropriation. My personal history is that we escaped Lebanon under imminent threat of execution. Could you imagine for someone with my personal history to watch the kind of whining that I see in the West? And what kind of offense? You want to talk about offense? It's an offense to the endless panoply of ways by which people truly suffer around the world to have these cuddled, infantilized folks. It's, it's, a, it's an affront to what true suffering is. A just society is rooted in the ethos of meritocracy. We are not social ants. And the, 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 the point I'm making here is that social ants, E.O. Wilson, the famous evolutionary biologist and entomologist, said regarding socialism and communism, he said, wonderful system, wrong species. Okay? <laughs> so so uh, communism is great, and socialism is great when you're a social ant. But for a species that does have hierarchies, then maybe that's not a great thing. Promote an ethos of, of course, intellectual and political diversity. All ideas, beliefs, and ideologies are open to criticism. I mean, here I'm preaching to the converted. No speech codes, no hostile environment, and so on and so forth. Science, reason, logic, and a commitment to evidence-based thinking trump ideology, hurt feelings, and fashionable, anti-science, faux intellectual gibberish. Thank you very much. Dr. Saad will now take uh, questions and comments. And again, this mic doesn't amplify, it merely records. Okay. Um, if I can go back to what you said about social justice math, um, so my mom's a teacher in elementary school in BC, and there's a new curriculum. It's all online. You can see it. And in the math section for all elementary school grades, it says um, part of the learning outcomes is integrate indigenous worldviews and perspectives on mathematical concepts. So is there any validity to this, or is it just nonsense? Uh, without knowing the specific case, I'm going to go with nonsense. Uh, so in other words, if there were true indigenous knowledge that somehow adds to the curses of mathematical knowledge, bring it on, great. But is there some mathematical knowledge that exists outside of the axioms of mathematics that only indigenous people are uh, you know, exposed to? No. Questions? Um, um, as, as I say each of these things, I'm already counting the tally of death threats I'll be receiving. <laughs> Jim. Yeah, I, I guess I little, get a little disturbed with uh, attributing all of this to universities. Like, administrators aren't universities. You know, a lot of this is going on within certain departments and uh, faculties within uh, universities. And I think if you find the people who are resistant to a lot of these ideas, they're probably more in... Uh, say science, uh, for, for example, in other sorts of areas. And isn't there a danger 
that we're sort of tarnishing, <laughs> you know, the institution as a whole, uh, you know, with these particular sorts of uh, cases. But uh, I mean, you don't need to have every single person at a university suffer from this nonsense or every p person being a per perpetrator of that nonsense for you to be concerned by it, right? How many victims do we need before we sort of stand up and in, in, in with, you know, with uh, being indignant, right? I mean, think about it. In, in the humanities and social sciences, I mean, there are now 40 years of students that have been taught, you know, some of the most impenetrable fake nonsense. And I mean, again, think about the opportunity cost. Every single one of these students could have done something unbelievably more productive with their time. And that, to me, is a, is a gargantuan injury. No, you know, I'm not saying not to be concerned. But you know, if you have a cancer somewhere, you don't assume the whole body eh, needs to be uh, treated. And so there's areas of the university eh, that are cancerous. Eh, and that what we should be careful about is targeting those areas rather than saying, you know, the administration is the university, for, ex for example, or, or the behavior of a group in a cultural anthropology class is the university, and, and so on. I teach psychology, eh, and I teach a balanced approach to uh, heritability and, uh, you know, socialization. I never get any objections from my students. Eh? They aren't up in arms, you know, because I'm doing that, uh, and so on. So, Again, I just think we've got something that's more of a localized but very visible yeah. sort of problem. Alex. So I want to thank you for coming and speaking with all of us. That was very uh, enlightful. Uh, so I'm a Concordia graduate myself in communications and uh, cultural studies, so I do appreciate you coming here to London. Uh, what I want to ask you about is your thoughts on the difference, first part, between uh, Quebec institutions, so French-speaking Quebec institutions, Concordia and McGill aside, but UCAM, UDM, and if you see that because Quebec is more nationalistic in their culture and in their hi history, do you see that they uh, are less prone to these ideological viruses you speak about? And you also often give the distinction between, you know, uh, academic institutions to the West versus places elsewhere, but do you think that this is more of a North American issue, or do you see an epidemic in European schools, in Asian schools, and so forth? No, I, I think I think the the what I call ostrich parasitic syndrome, which is sort of the collection of these maladies, uh, can afflict anybody anywhere. So if I was I was asked. Uh, is this something that afflicts people on the left more? And my answer is no. I mean, in, in its current manifestation, yes, because a lot of the voices are coming from the left in this case. But it could afflict, so for example, science denialism doesn't happen only on the left or on the right. It's a different form of science denialism that happens, right? So if when it comes to, for example, denying evolution, it'll be the people on the right who deny evolution. The sort of the religious folks. When it comes to denying evolutionary psychology or the fact that there's a biological basis to our human nature, it is people on the left. So I, so I don't think it is, it is restricted to a, a geographical location or a political aisle. I think what makes this so problematic is that anybody, anytime can be. And some of my very good friends, some of the folks that you guys all know and respect, regrettably have now fallen victims to OPS. I won't mention names, but they have. Steven. I want to avoid polemics from myself because this is questions for you, but I do have to follow up on the previous comment. I'm a psychologist, and I think psychology has been poisoned. Um, I, I, not as badly as sociology, obviously, and not as badly as humanities, but psychology has been poisoned. My research has been stifled. I've been rejected for little grants that should have been given me because I asked the wrong questions. I'm constantly worried about what I say, but I also have a close relationship with my colleagues in biology. I've been acting chair of the biology department, and I tell them repeatedly, they're coming for you. Right. They're coming for you. So yes, I mean, humanities, ed I mean, education's always been lost. And so, but I think it's wrong to think that it's, that it's segregated to certain parts. It's, it's a matter of how advanced the, the yeah. virus is. Could, could you comment on that? Well, I think, so to kind of link both of your comments, it, it, there, you often hear this, uh, 
you know, the neighborhood where I live, I don't see that particular problem. So clearly it must not exist. I think you have to have a wider view. Uh, you don't have a heart attack and you're healthy until you drop dead from a heart attack. But three minutes earlier, you said, this can't affect me. I'm perfectly fine. So I, I think that uh, notwithstanding the fact that you may not have experienced it yourself, I think it is something that we should all be very concerned about. Uh, I'll just give you one example. I comment about issues outside of what we're talking about here. For example, whether certain religious ideologies that might be antithetical to every single liberal values that, that we hold dear, anybody in this room, whether it's a good idea to have a, an increase of those values in Canada, right? Oftentimes, I get tons of people who write to me and say, but, but I don't see any of the stuff you're talking about. I go buy my tomatoes and I go to my daughters. I don't see it. That's a myopic view, sort of open the neighborhood to f outside of your neighborhood. It's, it's coming. It's over there. It's around the corner. So I think you're right. I think you're fortunate that you haven't seen it. Grant. Um, an, early, an earlier commenter was saying, don't brand the whole university with, with the same brush. My problem with that attitude is when something like this we're talking about today happens, there's one or two, there's David Haskell and there's sometimes in the past Clive, who would stand up and mark now, rant and rave about it, but 99.9% but of the university would be silent about it or support it. And so in that sense, yes, brand the whole university with that brush because they're the ones who are sitting by idly allowing it to happen without any objection, without any, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my own career and I'm, you know, hunkered down and I'm not going to say anything about it because I don't want it to affect me. Yes, it is a university-wide problem. You know, it's, um, thank you for saying that because I often receive emails from professors who privately say, oh my God, thank you so much for what you, I say, well, why do you send me a private email? Why don't you advertise your position? Is it, are you, are you, are you ashamed of your, I mean, am I on the wrong side of the issues? But that's the problem. They're, but in their silence, they're complicit. So you don't have to have everybody at the university be a rabid social justice warrior. If you know that they exist and you do nothing about it, as far as I'm concerned, you're as guilty as they are. Rick. Yeah, I guess one thing I will say about the, uh, as a comment to your ostrich parasitic syndrome is uh, this year when I just talked about things like sex differences in my introductory psychology class, just the way uh, word spread and, you know, students who had been, <clears throat> you know, uh, quite close to me in terms of, you know, a good working relationship just suddenly stopped talking to me. It was real eye-opening to see how quickly it takes over and the way, and just how, uh, how intense the effect is. So the, just the question I have is, the way I almost see it is, uh, how do we actually cure the people who have been infected? Uh, to, uh, like the, the only thing that seems to come to mind is maybe try to do research on the deprogramming of cult members, but I, wasn't, I wanted to know what your thoughts were, like for the actual people who are afflicted, what can we actually do for them? I mean, I truly think that it's a question of teaching people how to better think. I mean, I know it sounds very grand, but it's, it's really amazing when you, when you challenge people. For example, if, you, if someone says, uh, religion X is peaceful. Okay. I say, okay, well, how, how did you arrive at this? I challenge them, right? So it's kind of somewhat a Socratic process. It's uh, sort of a, a pointed epistemological approach. It's really teaching people to not be cognitively lazy. You know, most people, uh, so as a consumer psychologist, one of the things I study is, you know, uh, when you're trying to... Uh, simplify the information overload in your environment, you might use a simplifying heuristic like uh, Japanese product, electronic products are great, right? That allows me to very quickly choose a product without having to do more search, right? So most of us have a sort of an innate desire to be cognitive misers. But for some of these issues, you can't be a cognitive miser. You really have to ask people to get engaged in building these nomological networks. And so that's how I, I mean, I'm sure there are many strategies. I try to convince people by the overwhelming data that goes against their position. And usually I'm able to, to be quite successful at it. I have Bill and Ava and Joanne and David, and um, maybe we'll have some more time after that, sure. but we'll see. No problem. Bill. I, a, a question, um, what's driving this? Uh, as a psychologist and sex researcher, I often use the metaphor of fetish. Um, 
the reactions to established knowledge, uh, epistemology, methodology, conversations such as the ones we're having, uh, correspond to the characteristics of a fetish reaction to a fetish object. They're highly selective, they're uncontrollable, and they're exaggerated. Um, and I see people, you know, who are making the uh, pronouncements that we're talking about, the anti-scientism, the uh, postmodernism, et cetera. I think the dynamic is some kind of nearly orgasmic pleasure. Um, the condemning, the condemning uh, of an established knowledge somehow confers virtue on the individual uh, and, and pleasure. What, what do you think the dynamic is? Where, yeah, that's that's a great from? question. I guess I'll be talking about some of the stuff Where in my book. From? Yeah, let me, let me go back to that Why slide. Why do you feel so good? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a singular explanation. I think it's a, it's a cocktail of, of different pathologies. So, for example, when it comes to the victimology mentality, uh, I, I've coined the term or the malady collective Munchausen or collective Munchausen by proxy. Right? So for those of you who don't know, uh, Munchausen syndrome is a psychiatric disorder whereby someone feigns a medical illness so that they can garner sympathy and empathy. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when you take someone who's under your care, typically your biological child, but it could be a pet, it could be an elderly parent, and you harm them so that then you can get the pleasure of the empathy and the sympathy by proxy. Well, when I see the victimology, right, it's not I think, therefore I am, it's I'm a victim, therefore I am. So there's a form of collective Munchausen whereby the main currency now is I get my strokes, my, my pleasure through being a victim, either myself or by proxy. I'm the social justice warrior who's helping those poor victims. So that would be, that would explain uh, the victimology mentality. The postmodernism I actually think I have a not nearly as sort of psychoanalytic explanation as yours. So Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and Jacques Lacan, and the rest of the French postmodernist scammers, I think simply stumbled on a way to get tons of people to actually show up and in complete reverence, listen to their complete random gibberish and take them seriously. And as someone who studies peacocking behavior, I can peacock by buying an Aston Martin, I can peacock by getting Harvard degrees, or I can peacock, if you'll give me the opportunity, of standing up in front of adoring undergrads and saying that the transposed eigenvalue of my inner self, right, and all the rest of the bullshit. And there's a bunch of people who think that because I'm engaging in what appears to be pseudo profundity, I must be saying something important and I get all the hot women on campus. So I think it's really as simple as that. They found an arbitrage profit to use an MBA, right? They found a way to be worthy in the ecosystem. Why do the chemists, sorry? Well, no, I think it's, why are the chemists and the physicists and the biologists getting all the attention? We also are important in the humanities, right? But it has to be something as impenetrable as what the mathematician is doing and what the physicist is doing, right? And the way I achieve that is instead of using mathematical symbols, I use impenetrable, complete random prose. There must be some profundity to it. Ava. It's bullshit. Um, I want to come back to what uh, Lin your comment, Lindsay. You mentioned that this has been going on for 40 years and the uh, gen uh, years, generations of students have been bamboozled and wasted their time and our, uh, our tax money. Actually, it's a bit longer than that for those of us who are older than you. It probably started <laughs> in the 60s. I, was, I happened to be living in Paris in the 60s at the time and I saw all of it, okay? Um, this, this horrible business is now moving to our schools and this teaching of this gender stuff and now indigenous mathematics in grade one. We can't teach children how to add and multiply and subtract, but we're going to introduce all these extraneous elements into it. I think the danger for our societies is now really very bad. And I, I'd just like you to comment on this penetration now into the schools. Well, uh, in, in when you're trying to uh, advertise to children, there are, different countries have different laws, but typically one argument is that you, you shouldn't be allowed to target children. Let's say you're selling cereal, I mean, I'm gonna come to your point. Uh, 
you shouldn't be able to target children in selling them cereals because they can't build a counter argument to it. So only when they're able to have the cognitive capacity to develop resistance to the persuasive message, that's when you're allowed, right? But can you think of one product that you're allowed to target your children straight out of the womb? No. Religion, right? So I can't sell chewing gum to a child when, when he's eight or nine because, you know, he's too cognitively fragile because of my persuasive message. But straight out of the womb, I could sell him my nonsense and nobody can do anything about it. So then to answer your question, it, it exactly. I need to get to that child at the point where he's got no defenses. That's when the buck is happening. It's as, it's as simple as, and it's not conspiratorial. It really is what's happening. Joanna. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get back quickly to um, uh, the slide where you talked about, we don't necessarily have to go there, but let's just recapture when you were talking um, about how convenient it is uh, for, uh, um, let's say, various disciplines to say, well, people act biological, uh, people act um, driven by culture when we're trying to understand their behavior and their sexuality, but uh, th then the various inconsistencies uh, creep in. For example, when people are seen as purely biological, purely uh, animals driven by biology, when we're considering, for example, ecological questions. So um, my, my quick, that's my quick comment. My question to you is, do you see a way um, that we can bring a lot of these, that we can bring the inconsistencies out and start bringing a discussion in which we're actually considering people um, as, as both more holistically, so that those who want to uh, condemn, let's say, uh, people's ecological behavior don't get away with saying, well, we're just like bacteria, uh, when those who are saying, well, uh, we're purely social constructs, get away with right. it a moment before that. Uh, look, evolutionary psychologists don't argue that we are strictly biological beings. Rather, the formal position is what's called interactionism. In other words, no evolutionary psychologist worth his salt doesn't recognize that for most traits that matter, we are an inextricable mix of our biology and our environment. Absolutely, but that's not what we hear, right? So, from so whom? From, from evolutionists or from, um, or from the ideal ones? From who uh, is it? So the inconsistency that I was talking about is that uh, people who are often, uh, let's say, um, if we're looking at ecological arguments, so for example, population is spreading too quickly, right? So human population growth must be stopped. People are, are, are seen as um, multiplying like bacteria or my, multiplying like other uh, Malthusian organisms, right? That are going to multiply as long as uh, there are resources for them and then there's going to be a population crash, right? While as uh, the other perspective that you were discussing earlier is, is a perspective of uh, more more culturally driven. So all I'm trying to say is that I wish we could build right. nom nomological uh, networks that would be more visible, that we could then apply uh, to problems across disciplines. So one of the, and I, I don't think I've ever mentioned this publicly, so maybe this is, as they're taping me, maybe this will be the time to do it. So one of the projects that I'm hoping to start is a website where people can submit their nomological network for some phenomenon. So that that way, after a certain time period, you know, instead of looking, it's not a literature review, right? A nomological network is not a literature review. It's, it's, it's a completely different way of thinking. It's what is all the data that I need to have that would render this argument unassailable? And so imagine now if you could go to this website and you want to look at uh, pornography, the evolutionary roots of pornography. Well, there is a nomological network that exists. So I'm hoping to do exactly what you're asking for, and that's one of my next projects. David? Uh, thanks for your talk, Gad. Um, what I was wondering about is, uh, well, first of all, just by way of background, so when I study religious groups and they're going to hire, they're going to hire a pastor, um, they have ideological conformity. So it's a board, they're going to hire a pastor. They're not going to hire anybody who doesn't have their same ideological background and, and really. So now I look at your slide where you show me that um, in communications, for example, yeah, they don't have anybody else except those who are like-minded. Right. So it, it's inconceivable that they would ever hire somebody else outside their tribe. Yeah. Right? So we're never going to have that diversity of opinion. So my question is, knowing that there are certain programs that are ideological tribes and they are 
absolutely hostile to outsiders, how do, how, we, do, how do we ever, how do we change that? Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, the, the sort of the, the vague response to that, but it might sound gimmicky, is I, I tell people that to the extent that we are innately tribal, right? So we are coalitional animals. We do see the world as blue team and red team, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, try to then instantiate your desire to belong to the tribe of truth. Now, we can get into what does truth mean. But in other words, uh, don't, let me give you a specific example. I'm, I often get someone who writes to me and says, well, you know, I, I watch all your stuff, I read all your stuff, I can't tell, are you a conservative, are you liberal, are you this, are you that? And my answer is, I'm none of those things. I'm a one idea at a time person. So sometimes, you, uh, on the death penalty, for example, I, I'm someone who thinks, uh, we don't have to get into all this now, but I believe that if you are a serial uh, rapist of children and we have 10, uh, your DNA in the, in the rectum of 10 children, uh, I feel no moral uh, difficulty of executing you, okay? On that dimension, then you would think, oh gee, this guy is right wing. When it comes to social issues, I'm about as liberal as they come. You would think I'm a social justice warrior, I mean, so to speak, right? So I'm an ideas guy. I, I let whatever cognitive consistency that exists within me allow me to take positions. I don't belong to left. I don't belong to classical liberal. I don't belong. Any. So what I would love for people to do is foster that bent. Simply take piecemeal ideas at a time and then using whatever moral compass you have, form an opinion that's hopefully informed. That's it. A few more questions, Gad, or are you, it's okay? I'm, I'm good. Go All right. It. Well, Christopher then. Yeah, so you talk a lot about uh, anti-science and all that kind of stuff. Um, from I'm in psychology, and, and the vibe I get now is that it's starting to actually happen uh, under the guise of science. With, for example, in personality psychology and social psychology, um, there's benevolent sexism and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And so, can, can I can I explain what that is before yeah, you give you? Okay. Sure. And actually, I've written several articles. I, on yeah, it. I saw one of those. <laughs> great. Uh, so. Uh, in the never-ending desire to find sexism everywhere, it turns out that the standard form of sexism that you would all be familiar with and that you would condemn is called hostile sexism. But there's another form of pernicious sexism that's called benevolent sexism. So if you are galant to a woman, that's benevolent sexism. If you open the door to a woman, that's benevolent sexism. If she is being attacked by three men and you come to save her, now you're in a real difficult position. Do I save her and then I'm a sexist or do I pretend I didn't hear her screaming and I could at least avoid the appellation of being a sexist? So that's what benevolent sexism is, folks. Go ahead. Yeah, so you talk a lot about like the solutions, what we can do as, as citizens and, and, every, and as academics and teaching. But now since it's actually gone into peer review, and I think the benevolent sexism scale has like 3,000 citations, something ridiculous, and, and a lot of it isn't very critical. I, I feel like as academics and as, as researchers, we can actually challenge that through science and, instead of just accepting it as accepted science, even though it's total crap. Yeah. So uh, your question is, what can we do to fight against this? Yeah. Fight against this. <laughs> In other words, do, do, you know, I, I, I mean, really, I receive innumerable emails from people. What can I do? What can I do? Just, you don't have to have a huge platform. Your professor says something that completely defies logic. Challenge them respectfully, politely, with civility, right? But challenge them. Don't be quiet. Don't, don't do what, regrettably, Lindsay had to do, which is uh, feel that she couldn't speak. You're a, you're a professor at a meeting. Someone says something that is contrary to human dignity. Challenge them on it. Everybody has a voice in this battle. It's ideological trench warfare. Just get engaged from the smallest possible way to the biggest possible way. Joanne. Um, I just would like to say, um, I know that this is a talk about what's happening in the universities, but it's really starting in JK. It's starting in elementary school with the victimology, that everybody has to get a trophy, nobody can fail. I know in 1992 I was fighting whole language with my children. I quit my job, rented a church, and ran a school for three years where my middle child would have been illiterate. Now I would be doing the same thing over the sex ed. But now we have 30% of our children in grade six are not competent in math or reading. There is something wrong here, and what we're teaching them is you are a victim, and 
you, de uh, you, you um, warrant uh, being praised for everything. They teach phonics, they teach the initial consonant, and anything you guess for that word, they tell you it's a great job, even though every word is wrong. So I think that what this all is happening now is just a manifestation of what has been going on for many, many right. years, starting with JK. Daniel. Uh, it's Daniel. <laughs> Excellent. I have a question. I'm a PhD student in computer science. In particular, I find it interesting with my peers oftentimes, especially with, say, some controversies involving the Google memo. Yes. I, I find a lot of my peers don't speak out in favor of the some of the conclusions that were in that memo. But And oftentimes they're very intelligent people, but they don't speak up like on the other side, but then often I'll find that faculty within my department, not necessarily my department, but in other universities that I've been, us, been a part of, they oftentimes will not, like they, that'll be the only side you'll hear is the one against the Demore memo. Right. Now, I, obviously I don't like the, memo was? oh, uh, this is involving sex differences and the demographics you find within the tech industry. So I can, maybe I can yes. summarize it for the people who don't know, because I actually knew about it. So just to give you the, the background to that story, I had been invited to the Google main campus to give a lecture. It's, what's, it's part of what, what they call the Talks at Google series. And my talk was on all my you know, evolutionary psychology stuff, right? And then a few days after that, the Google memo broke. So the rumor on the internet was it was someone who had been at my talk who had been <laughs> emboldened by it. And, and so then before the whole thing breaks out, I was in contact with James Damore for him to come on my show. I was in California on vacation with my family. But then the, the Google people who, who, are, who were fans, who had invited me, said, if you speak to James Damore, we can guarantee you what's going to happen to your lecture, meaning that it would never be posted. And so we took the very sort of pragmatic decision of holding off our conversation until after Google had posted my talk. But the fact that we even have to engage in this mental calculus is extraordinary. This is supposed to be Google, but they do no evil, and they were engaging mm -hmm. in evil. Yes, so my question is, as, since I'm kind of early on in my academic career, but I obviously like to go to the academic route, um, I'm one of these theory people, I love my theoretical computer science. Um, do you have any advice for any PhD students that really are wanting to help fix this problem, whether fixing is the right word, yeah. um, and whether it be short term or long term, any advice for, say, researchers and that, that want to fight in this battle any advice for them that they could use now? Because yes. right now, obviously, if, say, for example, if I were to be very openly against some of the policies that are out right now, especially in CS departments. Yes. Uh, for example, there are uh, one example now. It's not usually talked about as often as there's, for example, women-only scholarships in a lot of CS yes. departments, which I find, like, uh, yeah. But yeah. anyways, my main point is, um, what advice can you give for a PhD student that wants to maybe find a tenure track position if there are one that exists? I got it. Well, to avoid uh, job yes. security issues. Uh, you know, I'm always conflicted when people ask me that question because I understand the pragmatic reality of people having real concerns. But those concerns arise not just as you as a PhD student. If now I'm an assistant professor, should I speak or wait till I'm tenured? Now when I am tenured, should I speak or wait until I have full professor? Now I'm full professor, should I wait or until I have my chair professorship? Now I'm chair professor, but I think I have a good shot at the Nobel Prize. Should I speak or wait <laughs> until that? Well, now I'm dead. Should I speak or, right? So my point is, this is... Uh, there's a, in, in ecological economics, some of you may be familiar with something called tragedy of the commons, right? So let me just briefly mention it for those of you who don't know. Suppose I've got a plot of land and they've got 10 farmers and we all agree, gentlemen agreement, none of us is, is going to use that plot of land for our uh, cattle to graze on it because we need it to recover, right? Now, each of us thinks, well, you know what, if I cheat on that agreement, I get my cattle to graze on the land, but the other nine guys will be super honorable. That's the ideal outcome, because I still get to, to do what I want, and all the others will be good. 
Of course, the tragedy of the commons is that every single one falls under that premise, and then we all cheat, and the whole thing goes to hell. How do we, how do we apply this to what you're saying? So the tragedy of the commons is, well, you know, I don't have to speak because I worry about my career, but let him speak. Let Gad Saad speak. Let Jordan Peterson speak. Let some other guy who puts his neck out speak because I got to worry about my PhD. I got to worry about my assistant. I got to... No. If we all were able to develop a term that you heard me use in the Canadian Senate, testicular fortitude, and speak in unison, the problem would be resolved very quickly. But because we're all bound to our myopic careerist interests, then it ends up being that the monster could keep coming at you. Rise up, speak. Matthew, then Cassia, and then Phil, and I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to end it there. Matthew. Uh, two quick questions. So Nick and I have tried to put the Chicago principles into Queens, and one of the things I found early on is getting our initial signers uh, was you'd have people willing to sign, but they wouldn't post about it on their Facebook. So expanding on this, uh, taking a principled stance versus a utilitarian stance of, you know, I'd ask the guy, it's like, can you, can you sign this? Great. They'd sign it, and then they wouldn't post about it. It's like, you know, you have the why wouldn't you sign it. Um, but, you know, also your, your point about, you know, needing to take a principled stance. Do you have any sort of specific advice on identifying when it's better to take a utilitarian stance and when it's better to take a principled stance? And then the second one, um, are you, and then, I grew up in the Ontario school system, so, you know, I, I'd say, you know, uh, I graduated high school in 2008, but I would say is, you know, you talk about being ready to defend yourself as a child, talking about the serial analogy. I would say we were never really taught critical thinking from a true, like, you know, a true, say, a first-year university logic course uh, in, in high school. And you say, would you say that, do you have any comments on the sufficiency of the school system not teaching basic logic? Uh, so the second part, yes, there's a complete lacuna of that. So I, I don't know what else to add other than we need to foster greater critical thinking. That's really the point of my next book. Your first comment, when should you be more utilitarian versus uh, uh, principled, it really is on a case-by-case, -case, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll post something where I'm really angry because no one is rising up. Uh, you know, get engaged, and then someone will write and say, oh, but it's easy for you to say because you're tenured, but I've got two young kids and I, I'm still an assistant professor. Right, but I received 3,000 death threats. Nobody knows you, so who's suffering more, right? In other words, there is no way for you to get engaged in war, this is war, this is ideological war, while being guaranteed that there'll be no harm to you, right? Did you, did you go to, to the invasion of Normandy and say, but I'll only sign up if you could absolutely guarantee, because you know, I've got young kids, because I've got my uncle, because I've got my PhD. No, you went knowing that you might die. So that's the kind of courage we need to foster. If we all stood up together, not worried about our idiosyncratic concerns and fought this horrible monster, these idea pathogens, it will be resolved quickly. If not, it's only going to continue for the foreseeable future. Cassia. So I have a question, oh, I have a question regarding this very interesting graph, and it's a conclusion to which I've kind of arrived on my own, but I obviously don't have the empirical data to back it up. So why would you say, I'm a, I have a humanities background, why would you say that there's a greater, like, what explanation is given that there, for the greater ratio of Democrat to Republic leaning? In those areas? Yes, rather yeah. in the humanities and not in engineering, because yeah. I've had a conversation with a math professor in which he says, well, it's all just, you guys, all, all you guys do is opinion. You guys talk about right. opinions. No? So uh, could you speak to that? Yes. Please? I think it's because a lot of those fields end up being driven a lot more by an ethos of activism rather than an ethos of knowledge, right? So what I mean by that is sociology inherently could be perfectly scientific, right? There are very serious sociologists, say quantitative mathematical sociologists, that do very, very elaborate, beautiful scientific work. They're not driven by activism. There is some phenomenon that they're interested in studying at the sociological level, and they apply the weaponry of the scientific method to study it. The problem is that in many of the fiel those fields, what dr the, e the driving engine, the raison d'etre of the person is not the pursuit of knowledge, it's the promulgation of activism and ideologies. And therefore, that's why you're gonna get that lopsided stuff. It's more difficult in business or in neuroscience or in uh, engineering 
to have this lopsidedness because the people who go into this can come in all varieties. They're there really to advance a field of knowledge. If you go into sociology, you've already self-selected yourself as an activist. That's the problem. I forgot that Salim was on the list. So, uh, Salim. Oh, my man. And then we'll go to Paul. My man. Thank you, Gab. Your 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 slide on that various pathogens on yeah, the what you had that you know with yeah the that's the one the one you just went by um, this one postmodernism and oh that the whole early, okay. list that yeah yeah, yeah hold on what what surprised yeah this hold one. on what what surprised me or 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 what I found missing uh, Gab maybe uh, you have a good reason for it is that I would say that all the box and the circle that you put up are particular description of the viruses, but there is a meta virus afflicting the West and the university is not outside of the society. And the meta virus afflicting the West is multiculturalism. Yeah, you're Everything right that I, falls into yes. That box. It, um, it's it's not on this slide just because I couldn't fit. Uh, I put so when, nine, when, when, when but the, the, the list of idea packages is greater than this yeah, one. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> when our prime minister says yes. soon after election to New York yeah. Times magazine yeah. that Canada has no core culture, right. there is no mainstream, the result is all of this and much more. And we, the Canadian people, elect him resoundingly. Yes. I guess the, what, when I put cultural relativism, that's related to the multicultural idea, right? Because that, that's how you, you promulgate that, but yeah. And now for our, our final question, and, and thanks very much for your patience, oh, no uh, Phil. My pleasure. Uh, as an engineer, I took great pride in one of those graphs. But <laughs> oh, the, the ratio but stuff? My, yeah, my, my uh, question is, is, I don't know whether, is basically, I, well, let's start. I'm finishing Martin Gilbert's book on, on the history of Judaism under Islam. Uh -huh. And one of the things that strikes me is that A, religion is a kind of virus, and, but, but also it seems to be an inherent part of how humans have evolved. <coughs> Did it have some survival value at yes. some stage? Yes, now? great question. So uh, if, you, if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to get a bit technical with, your, with the answer. Uh, when you're studying uh, a cultural form, let's say music, uh, art, religion, from an evolutionary perspective, there are several ways that you could study it. One way is to argue that that form has adaptive value, right? So it's an adaptation. I'll explain in a second, okay? Another way is to argue that it is an exaptation. And an adaptation is that something confers either survival or reproductive benefits. So in the case of religion, an adaptive argument for religion would be, and this is the argument that David Sloan Wilson, an evolutionary biologist, a good friend of mine has made in a book called Darwin's Cathedral. If a group that is religious has greater communality, greater cohesion, greater demarcation between us versus them, and if that confers survival advantage to the group, more so than a group that, it, that lacks in religiosity, that would be an adaptive argument for religion. Others argue no. There is no adaptation to religion. Rather, religion is an exaptation. The key proponent of that idea is an anthropologist by the name of Pascal Boyer, who was on my show. And the argument there is that an exaptation is a byproduct of evolution. For example, uh, the color, of our, the color of our skeletal system, whatever it is, is not due to the fact that that is an adaptation. It's a byproduct. It's a path dependency, right? So, so then applying it to religion, we are, for example, a coalitional animal. We already have the neuronal system to view the world as us versus them. That neural system already exists. Religion piggybacks on it, on it right? right? Abrahamic languages all have, they are the Jews, the Gentiles. The, the believers and the kuffar, the, the, right? They are the ones who are going with Jesus and the rest of us who are going to burn in hell, right? So there's a very clear demarcation between us versus them. So the exaptation argument is that there is no adaptive value to religion. It's just some, it, 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 it uses its memoplex, its, its viral qualities to, to latch on systems that already exist. 
And I'm not sure where I stand on it because both arguments are reasonably compelling to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.